Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, Book of Luke, Light Giver. And certainly he does spread that light, truth upon the nation and the world as to exactly how it's going to be. Christianity, not a religion, but a reality. And he lays it out where it is a reality. Christ has come to that place where he's preparing the place for the Last Supper. And probably the thing I want you to really notice about this is God doesn't do anything by happenstance. It's all pre-planned. That's why you can depend on prophecy because God has it all planned out. And if you can read that, then you pretty well know the way things are going down. So he has just instructed um, uh, Peter and John saying, you, you go on into town and this is how you and find us a place for the um, not, not the Passover feast, but the Last Supper is what most people would call it. The correct name is Kagaga. Okay, and uh, but he sends them away and tells them, "Go find a place that we can do that." Verse, pick it up with uh, chapter twenty-two, verse nine, and this is what they said to him. And they said unto him, "Where wilt thou that we prepare?" Question. And again, note how this is all prearranged, 10. And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. Now, we all know that the Last Supper was held at, Saint, at Mark John's mother's house. Now, what, what is this man then we're meeting? No doubt it's Mark John's father. Okay. Because he's going to turn in at, um, at uh, the mother's home. But what would, there be, what would be unusual about this? A man never carried a pitcher of water. Men carried water in wineskins. Women and women only carried pitchers of water. But here was a sign that's going to stand out like, as we might say, a sore thumb, whereby people would know and understand this is not a normal thing. And it is a sign placed there by God himself prearranging whereby man could know and understand. And um, where did this man enter into? Well, his own house, of course. This is why most people think, according to Acts chapter 12, verse 12, signifies naturally that it's Mark John's mother and father's home. Verse 11, And you shall say unto the good man of the house, again, this man, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Question. And what would he say? 12, and he shall show you a large upper room furnished there make ready. In other words, it was all prearranged. He knew which room it was. He knew it was going to be the upper room. And here would be this, as you've seen the picture or statuettes of, uh, and makeup of the Last Supper with Christ and all the disciples sitting at this one table uh, in this uh, guest chamber. This was prearranged. Now, well, how could that be? Well, our Father's in control. That's why you can love Him and trust Him. And no, if you'll just understand and listen to Him, if you have faith in what He says, you won't go down so many blind alleys stumping your toe and getting in trouble. Listen to your Father. Again, all prearranged. Thirteen, and they went and found, as he had said unto them, big surprise, not at all, exactly as he said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. It was all set. 
verse 14, And when the hour was come, he sat down, the twelve apostles with him, and here you have them all seated, and you have the twelve, and you have the Last Supper, 15. And he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. In other words, he's letting them know, this, this is it. This will be the last one. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That is the kingdom of God. That is God and his, the king and his dominion, taking power, defeating death. And then it is written in another place that he would take this, pass, this Passover anew with us again, which is today the Lord's table as he's about to bring into existence the new covenant. Verse 17, how did he bring that into being? Well, listen to it. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. This was the common cup. 18, for I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. In other words, it's here. This is the time he had prepared them Verse 19, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And so it is, this certainly was not the crumbs picked up from feeding the 5,000. This was the true bread of life and Christ was that bread of life. And it was this body that took the stripes. It is our body that gets, receives the healing. And from that cup, it is, it is that cup that is his blood shed on the cross, that's the covenant, that washes away our sins on repentance, whereby they don't exist any longer. He did that for us. He did that in remembrance of us. And that's why he said, do these things in remembrance of the fact that I do this for you. And um, then he continues, verse 20, listen carefully. And verse 20 reads, likewise, also the cup, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new Testament. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And this is not just a happenstance. It is a covenant. It is the testament. Verse 21, But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. In other words, my adversary is sitting right here. And naturally, they're going to wonder, this, this had to hurt him. I mean, th this also was prearranged to the sense. He knows it's going to happen. Judas has already approached the, the chief uh, priest, uh, not appointed by God, but by a Roman general, and arranged to betray Christ. And even as Christ is making this new covenant to heal our bodies and to forgive our sins, we have a betrayer in the midst. 22, and truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, as it was written, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. Well, where, where was it determined that this would transpire? Well, uh, Psalms 22, that he would be delivered up, that he would be crucified, and that a generation would be set aside, in which would be the the uh, final generation, actually the generation of the fig tree, to perform that that must be formed, for that also is prearranged, different subject for a different time. Passover is approaching. How precious it is that that he would do for us. Uh, verse 23, and they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. I would never betray him. I wouldn't betray him. They have no conception. Judas knows. 
24, what do they do when trouble like this starts? What, what really begins to happen then? Listen carefully and learn. Don't let this happen to you. 24, and there was also a strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? Here you have the Son of God making the new covenant, letting them know I'm shedding my blood and my body for you. And they're wondering which one of them is going to be the greatest when the greatest of all was right there in their midst. He was still with them. And they would have the audacity to murmur among themselves which of them would be the greatest when he was before them that, would, that made this covenant, which is eternal even to this day. And I, I'm sure it hurt his feelings. I'm sure it disappointed him greatly. This was his disciples. These are the men he had taught, had lived with them, led them, instructed them, Um, and I mentioned that our Heavenly Father has many disappointments, especially when His elect go bad. Verse 25, And He said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority, that's power, upon them are called benefactors. I mean, that's the way they operate. That's the way the ungodly operate. Verse 26, but you shall not be so. You don't do it that way. But, let that, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief be as he, he that uh, doth serve. In other words, let it be, because why? He had served them. He served him the cup, and, and as he is serving that cup and, and uh, humbly coming to them, giving that covenant and making those promises of eternal life, they want to know which of them is the greatest. That's why he tells them and sets the example. He served the cup to them. They didn't serve it to him, and he was the greater. 27. For whither is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth? Is not he that sitteth at meat? Question. But I am among you as he that serveth. 28. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, in the trials that I've gone through where we've hit those old trails, I've been cursed, I've been spat at, been called names. You, you have been there, you have witnessed it, you've also witnessed all the wonderful miracles and wonders that I have performed. 29, and I appoint unto you. What he's saying here, this appoint means I covenant unto you a kingdom a king in his dominion, as my Father hath appointed unto me. I make this available. Verse 30, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. How fantastic. And here he is, the one that serves, being the greater of all, and yet having the patience and the love to share with these that will soon scatter to the winds when he is delivered up, unfortunately. But they will gather back together. The leadership will prevail. Verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. He didn't call him Peter, the Petra, which is to say the rock, the rock. No, he called him Simon, Simon. 
Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, and he may sift you as wheat. Do you know what that means, sift you as wheat? It means he's, he's going to look for every weakness you've ever had. He knows those weaknesses. He knows your desires. He's observed you. He's sifted you. Satan knows God's elect, and you want to make a, a mental note of that, and you want to stick with it. Uh, um, I know that Peter loved the Lord, and I think that God used him as an example because it would be he that would lead into the church. But yet at the same time, he will deny Christ thrice before the cock crow in the morning twice. 32. But I have prayed for thee, talking to Peter, Simon here, I have prayed for thee, think about this, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, not converted, but recovered, when you have recovered, strengthen thy brethren. He knew he would, he would um, uh, conform to the building of the church and that he would have to strengthen the brethren for they would scatter. 33, again, remember, you might say, well, how would he know this? It's all prearranged. That is to say the execution and the establishment of the kingdom here on earth. Not necessarily what each individual will do, that is not prearranged. For you have the freedom to make choices unless you be one of God's elect. Um, and how precious it is. Verse, let's go with the next verse, 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. I'm going to stick with you. I'm right by your side. And I know Peter must have meant that. I really think that God used Peter to teach us a lesson. For there would be another place that, that Christ would say, Peter, lovest thou me? And Peter would say, well, Lord, you, you know I do. Peter, lovest thou me? Lord, you know I do. And each time the Lord would say, well, then feed my lambs first. That's the little ones. And the next time it would be, feed my sheep. And then one more time he would say, Peter, lovest thou me, Philo? Lord, you know I do. Feed my sheep. In other words, the idea was you pass this word along. You've been taught. You've been instructed. It's important that the children have this knowledge, that the church be established. Peter would accomplish that. But I, I feel that he went through this to teach us a lesson. For the false Messiah is coming. You're going to be delivered up before him. What are you going to do? You're not going to run and you're not going to deny Christ. You deny the Holy Spirit the privilege of speaking through you. That's unforgivable. So that, that is totally out of mind and out of the question. I know quite the contrary that that will not happen. But at the same time, you want to fortify yourself with faith and knowledge and understanding to know you have a destiny and a purpose. And that position must come to pass, and, and it shall. And I feel that God let us look into Peter's own heart and emotions as he went through this, because he looked straight at him and he would say in verse 34, and he said, I tell thee, Peter, and here he calls him Petra, the rock, the builder, the rock he'll build the church on that is movable, but Christ being the immovable rock. I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. I know that had to break his heart, the way he loved the Lord. He didn't mind going into action for the Lord. And that's one of the reasons I think this also was predetermined as a lesson to us to prepare us for what is coming. Verse 35, And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked you anything? And they said nothing. I sent you out there without money and I didn't give you a begging bag. You didn't have to beg. 
And did you lack anything by having faith in me? And they said, no, no, we didn't lack anything. And that's how it is. So that strengthen your faith in him and know regardless of what happens, he is with us. Verse 36, then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise, his scrip, you take a little begging bag if you have to. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. In other words, if you don't have the faith and the knowledge and the wisdom to understand these things, you better take a begging bag. You better take something else. Why? Well, if you don't have faith in God, and many people do, many people have to beg to have a ministry going. And, and this, is a, this is sad. It is a really a sad thing. Because if you have the faith, and if you teach Christ's word, instead of man's traditions, you will never have to beg. And at the same time, you will never lack anything. Because God always provides for his own. It is written, it is documented, it is proven over and over. And if you don't have that faith, you might as well go the way of the world and you better get you a sword. But what kind of sword are we talking about? What kind of sword gives you the victory? If you are a minister, if you are a pastor, if you're a servant of the living God. It is not a sword lashed to your side, which that's fine if you have to protect yourself and your family, no problem. But the sword you use where the real power comes in is as it is written in Revelation chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, Christ's tongue is a two-edged sword, meaning the truth is a two-edged sword. And if you can't have the truth and the faith in that truth, you better go the way of the world because you're going to need it. What does that mean? Well, God's not going to be with you. You're going to be out there by yourself. He's not going with you. If you do not have the faith and the knowledge to, in the tongue of the Lord, that means the truth of this word to have absorbed it in your mind and from the word itself, whereby you know the ramifications and you know what it is our Father would have you do, then you better beg and you better do the other things because you're going to need it. But as long as you stick with the Father and have faith in Him and use the correct sword, that's the word of the Lord, is powerful. It conquers. It cuts down the enemy. It drives that sword straight into the heart of the devil. And he runs from you because Christ gave us power over him. But it takes faith to do that. When you exercise that faith, you have no problem. All things fall in place. You will lack nothing. Verse 37, these poor Poor guys, what do they say? Christ continues, For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. In, in what now? In me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. Um, and and uh, so you have it. Well, where, where is that written? Well, it's written in Isaiah chapter 53, verse, um, you'll find it in verse 17. And um, 53, Isaiah 53, um, not 17, make it 12. Isaiah 53, 12, and it reads, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors. This is what he was quoting. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He made intercession for you, made it possible for you to say, I love you, Lord. Forgive me of all my shortcomings and use me 
Back up one verse to the 11th. He shall, he shall see of the travail of his soul, he was crucified, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. By what now? This is what's important. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He stands for their sin. Why? He forgives them. When you repent, he erases it. His blood washes it away. And, and there you have it, how precious it is that he is that he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. And so it is, they're, they're washed away when you repent. 38, and they said, Lord, they, they're not quite with it. Listen to these poor words. They said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. Let's stop this. He was, he was hurt. He had to be. They did not understand. These that had walked with him. I, I, was this cloud placed there for a purpose so that you could learn from it today? I think so. They, they were armed. They, carried, they went through very dangerous areas. And they, they did carry weapons. And you'll, it will be proved in this very same chapter that Peter had a weapon and he sliced off the ear of Malchus, one of the chief priest's uh, servants. Whack! I mean, he, you know, it takes a pretty good swordsman to do that without just cracking a skull wide open. If you're well enough of a swordsman that you can slice an ear without breaking the skull, you're pretty good. So Peter knew what he was doing. Back to his teachings, 39. And he came out and he went on his, uh, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives, back, back over to, no doubt, Bethany. Uh, and his disciples also followed him. This is Gethsemane, okay, the Garden of Gethsemane, 40. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. That's what you want to remember today. Don't be tempted by the false one. He's coming. He's going to perform some miracles that are going to be astounding. Don't be tempted. You pray for knowledge and wisdom, for that is what frees you from the anxieties. 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a, a stone's cast. He pulled away to himself. And he kneeled down and prayed. What did he say? 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, it is real sad that many teachers, they absolutely teach Christ was praying that the crucifixion could be removed from him. That's not what he's talking about. He's still thinking about the children. And, and when, when he says this, what is he talking about? That also is in Isaiah, and you'll find it in, in 51, and it is the one where we're going to go to verse 17. What cup is he talking about? If you've ever studied the book of Revelation, you should know what cup he's talking about. It's the vial. Listen to it, verse 17. Awake, awake, and stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. There is none to guide her among the sons whom she has brought forth, neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she has brought up. Well, there's God's elect, and I hope that and pray that they stand up here in the end times. It's the cup of trembling. He said, is there some other way we can do other than pour the seven vials, the cup of God's wrath, out upon them? Is there any way we can bring them to salvation? There wasn't. It had to be done. So he wasn't praying that he should escape crucifixion. He was doing that for us, the body and the blood, already promised. But now the conclusion, that is to say the end where that cup 
needed to be poured out. Uh, and, and so it was. Uh, then he would say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. In other words, you, the supreme knows. Verse 43, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Um, in other words, uh, to invigorate him. Just watch. 44, And being in an agony, that, that's acute anxiety, not agony, acute anxiety. He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. 45, And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. Oh my, don't ever go to sleep on watch. 46, And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Now, understand, we're right here at Gethsemane, which means what? It's the olive press. It's where you press the very oil out of the olive, the oil of our people. And the pressure is there. And they sleep. Don't you dare go to sleep on watch. Verse 47, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, here they come, one of the twelve went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. Here we have that kiss of the traitor, this one Judas. Judas knew where they would be there at Gethsemane. Judas knew where they would be on the Mount of Olives. There would be no people around. It would be very easy to betray him here in this place. And what did he betray him with? A kiss. A time, a, a, a sign of affection, a kiss of love, but betraying as a, a, a and, and bringing forth um, the very tragic, Uh, beguiling and going against what you really believed. That is to say, to, to be a counterfeiter right in the very heart of the disciples, to betray the Lord Jesus Christ with a kiss of all things, a sign of love. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, hey, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? We can never answer all the questions, but we'll take a handful. Who knows? Yours may be there. And uh, never please ask a question about a certain reverend or denomination or organization. We do not judge people. God is judge. Leave that in his court. And you stay clear of it at this time. Our Father loves his children. And he gives you the gift of discernment to know who you should study with, who you should socialize with, and always pay attention to that gift. It keeps you out of much trouble. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? You don't need a number. You don't need an address. Why? 
Well, God knows what you're thinking. He's a mind reader, cardio knower in the Greek. Knows your heart. And you don't even have to say it out loud. You can pray anytime you want to. No one can prevent you from praying because they don't even know you are praying. But God does. He hears you. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, in question time, we're going to go with Jason from Georgia. My, God teaches us to forgive people that has hurt us and, or others, but do you think that person should also try to ask for forgiveness? Well, it's a good thing if they should, if they would. Um, if that person doesn't care about what they have uh, done, and flips you off should you go different routes. Well, I would hope so. You know, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 tells you how to handle a person like that. You don't necessarily have to treat him as an enemy, but separate yourself from them. You don't have to put up with that. You can forgive them, but if they don't ask for forgiveness, set, set them off to the side. Don't let them run over you. That interferes with your serving God. If you let somebody around you that gives you trouble, it interferes with the ministry of the living God. You do not let that happen. You don't have to let it happen. God doesn't expect you to. Ben from Maryland, where in the Bible does it say that Satan is coming first? Well, all through the Bible. God made it real simple where even a child can understand that he's coming first because he set up seven periods of time and let you know in the book of Revelation what's going to happen in each of those periods of time. Well, it so happens that in the sixth period of time, Satan comes. Christ doesn't return until the seventh period of time. That's why a child can understand it and know that Satan comes first. Um, the book of... Uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 lets you know that the false Christ comes first. That's why he said, if they tell you he's out here or there, don't believe it. Don't go. You stay in the field working. Don't be that first one taken by the Antichrist. But many will be taken because of their ignorance of God's word. And, but God makes it so simple, again, that a child can count from one to seven. Emma from Texas, are there any prophets or apostles today? Well, there will be the moment. We have a lot of uh, prophets, uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, on and on the list goes. David was even a prophet. Uh, Moses was a prophet. Aaron was a prophet. And on and on it goes. Uh, but we also know that after... The false Christ appears, and the Holy Spirit begins speaking through God's children when they're delivered up, both sons and daughters, that they shall prophesy and shall teach. So then it comes alive. Well, it's not them that talk, but the Holy Spirit. A Christian from Tennessee, and what if, what if you had a secret and you want to share it with your friends what do you do? Well, just know once you share it with your friends, it's not going to be a secret any longer, okay? I, I, I figure you're a, a school child. I don't see an age on here, but I am, I'm sure you um, are a school child. And what if you don't know what talent you have? What do you do? Well, you keep studying God's Word, and God will show you everybody has gifts, and You'll find out what that gift is. And Pastor Arnold Murray, how do you know everything? Well, no, nobody knows everything, all right? And Pastor Murray, I see on, I see on, I can't make that one. It says when you die, you'll go to heaven. Are they right? They are correct. When you, when you pass away, you go to paradise, which is where God is. And wherever God is, that's heaven. But many go there to be judged. And uh, sometimes when after the judgment, they end up in another place. And here I have another a good drawer of a cross. 
And this is Christopher from Tennessee. Pastor Arnold Murray, thanks for teaching us the Bible, but why do people in Cuba hate and kill people who pray and believe in the Lord? Well, unfortunately, um, uh, Christopher, let's say that not everyone in Cuba does that because not all, there, are, there are Christians in Cuba, but there are also communists. And communists, they do not like for people to pray when they don't believe in God. And they try to drive God from the midst, and this is why that comes to pass. Uh, there are some bad people there, as there are in many places. Uh, Louise from Oregon, uh, and I'm glad that you and your husband are blessed with the ministry. Uh, your question, in the very first earth age, were the heavens destroyed? No, the, the age was destroyed, not heaven. Okay. It's the same way with the earth. The earth age was destroyed, but not the, not the earth itself. The heaven is eternal and earth is eternal. But there are ages that, the, the word translated many times world is eons, okay? And um, it means time periods. There are three. The one that was, this one, and one that will come will be eternal. Christopher from Washington, I have a question to ask is what exactly does Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 when it says for the living know that they shall die but the dead know not anything neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Well it's that most of all you have to understand the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was written to who? to the man that walks under the sun, meaning in flesh bodies. And what it's talking about is that once this flesh body dies, it goes into the ground and it goes back to dirt and nobody remembers it. Why? It's, a, it's dirt. That's all, that's all it consists of is dirt. Therefore, it is gone and, and good riddance, quite frankly, because you have, it's not your real body. Your real body is your spiritual body. It doesn't get old, it doesn't get sick, it doesn't wither, it doesn't, uh, it's, it's eternal. So uh, that ninth chapter is written to the flesh body. But if you wanna know what happens truly, go on to the 12th chapter where when the silver cord parts, that's you die, instantly your soul is going to return, that is to say your spirit, the intellect of your soul and your soul, to the Father that gave it. Ecclesiastes is a fantastic book, but you've got to realize it's written to the flesh man, telling you how to find happiness in these flesh bodies and still be a servant of the living God. Uh, Tommy from Tennessee, it, if all that dies are already risen, why are we preached to that will be resurrected from the grave at Judgment Day? Ignorance is bliss, I suppose. Um, Christ tried to make this so simple in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where he said, if you believe Christ is already risen from the grave, you better believe all those that are dead have risen also. They're out of here. And then he says, there's no way that we who are alive and remain can precede the dead. Why? They're already gone. So they're with the Father. Our Father is not the God of dead, but of the living. And they're all living with him, awaiting judgment and um, uh, at the end of the millennium. And that's as it is. We have a Father that certainly is a Father of love. And that doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved. They're not because it's written also that many will fall. But our Father does love His children, and He hopes they will return that love and live eternally. If they don't, hey, bad trip. L.A. from South Carolina, and I'm glad you enjoy the studies. Here is my question. Why is it that I can't remember all that I study in God's Word? When I'm, when I'm asked a question concerning God's Word, deep down I know, and I know it, but it just won't come to me 
at that time, could this mean God ha has not accepted me? No, not, not at all. No one, no one can remember all of God's word. Some of us are gifted for teaching reasons and the fact that we've studied so many years that uh, we, and, and we're blessed, we have to give God the credit for a good memory and, and so forth, but it is necessary that a teacher have a good memory. But this is why a lay person should have a strong concordance. This way, if you can remember one sentence Let's take the shortest sentence in God's word. Jesus wept. All you have to do is take the, the word Jesus, you know is mentioned many times, but wept, maybe not so many. So look up wept like you would in a, a Webster's Dictionary and it will tell you exactly where that scripture is. You can find whatever scripture you want if you can remember one or two of the main words. Yeah, but th God, God does not, he did not, bring salvation because we're the smartest people in the world. He brought salvation because he loves us. If you have faith in that son, then you will have eternal life. Nobody's gonna take that away from you. Lee from Montana, in Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, God warns uh, of adding to or taking away words to this book are those who incorrectly translate the Greek and Hebrew text and change words in the Bible to fit their religion in danger of this warning. Let's divide what you have said. Those who incorrectly translate, if it's an accident or ignorance, then God would forgive that if they made correction but to do it purposely to fit their own religion for Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality, then that probably you would be in a heap of hurt. But naturally, the letters were originally written in a different language. And if all you can cover is English, then you've got to have help in understanding uh, the, the scripture. <clears throat> and so it is. This is why, again, I really highly recommend a strong Concordance because it gives you, an English reader, the ability to go back to the original language and check it out for yourself. Okay, uh, Valerie from Georgia. Um, finally, a teacher who has turned on the lights. Thank you, and that, the old light giver will do it too, okay. Um, uh, Valerie, baptism is for a person at the age of accountability who of their own choice decide to make a public statement that they believe that Christ went into the tomb but that he resurrected. That's what going under the water and coming out of the water signifies. And they make that a public statement. There is only one baptism, and each person must make that decision for themselves. Your parents can't make it for you. No one else can make it for you. You must make that decision. It is a beautiful thing. Mark from Virginia, my question is, when the fallen angels come to this earth again, will they be mortal or supernatural? They better watch coming after my daughter as I'm a country boy with a lot of guns. Well, uh, it's good to always protect your family. They are supernatural, but I think, Mark, you've already taught your daughter how to tell them where to go in the name of Christ, and they have to obey. He gives us power over them. She will have power over them. And I got a feeling you've already taught her about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, and she'll know how to handle it. Uh, and also uh, Luke chapter um, uh, uh, 10, verses 18 and 19, giving us power over all of our enemies, including those fallen angels and Satan. Leslie from Mississippi, question. They are saying that the ice is melting in Alaska. I'm wondering if it's God's plan to give our adversaries better access to our border. No, the ice is not melting in Alaska except in the spring and summer. In the winter, the ice does not melt in Alaska. 
And quite frankly, Antarctica is iced over from one end to the other, more ice than there's been in years and years and years. And the polar bear in Alaska are happy, happy, happy. And multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. All in God's own way and time. You know, I would think with severe winters all around the world that these jackals that chirp about global warming um, are, I would think they would be kind of ashamed by now and realize that a lot of the data was monkeyed with, that they were fed, or they monkeyed with it themselves. But they've been proven liars. And so it is. God himself states we'll always have hot and we'll always have cold. And guess what? Now's the time for cold. But guess what? It's winter time. And whatever God sends, we can cut it. We'll make plan around it and it'll be just fine. But I'm sure there are a lot of these larger cities that have a lot of grumble bums about snow and ice stacking up, and maybe rightly so. They've run out of money to clear ice and snow this winter. Maybe, maybe the global warming boys could go up and blow a lot of that hot air on those streets and maybe help the people out in the big cities. Uh, who knows? Um, am I jesting? Well, it's not funny. Global warming um, has been it's strictly, strictly a way for our government to try to bring taxation on carbon emissions because they want to rip us off for tax money. More money, more money, spin, 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 rather than save, save, save. That's where it comes from. Okay, if um, this is um, Patty from Maryland. Please answer this question for me. If our flesh is left behind when we die and our spiritual body returns to God, then why did Jesus take his body from the tomb when he rose? Was it so that he could teach his disciples to prove that he had defeated death? Exactly. And so it is written that that was the reason it would be. Uh, he defeated death. And this is one of the things that it stipulates in 1 Thessalonians 4. If you have to believe that Christ defeated death. Why? He took his body with him. He was transfigured. That has happened uh, also. It happened to, to uh, Enoch and it happened to Elijah. But it certainly happened to our Lord and Savior, so we would know. Gene from Arizona. Okay, I'm glad um, you enjoy listening. I believe, as you do, only one discrepancy. I would like to think that there will be babies in heaven. My first great-grandson was a stillborn. I love children as much as I love life. I would be sad to get to heaven and see a 30-ish young man when it came, could be my baby grandson. Where is this found in the Bible, please? God said we would have the desire of our heart. If that is the case, I pray that God will remove that desire from me. Well, um, it is true that all angels that we have seen are young people, okay? And we know that all of us are the same age, even your baby grandson. It's the same age you are. His soul was created in the first earth age. And so it is. <coughs> Excuse me, we're live. And uh, so it is. But that's, that is, we know that what stops the end of this earth age is that all souls are born of woman. And that's it. There's no more. God only created so many. And that brings about the end. Uh, you're going to love him when you see him. Okay. And you will see him. Joyce from Kentucky, the Bible said Jesus was crucified on a tree or a stake. Is this the same or is this different from a cross? Please explain. He was, the way you um, decipher what he was, how he was crucified is who did it. And naturally, the Romans, because the uh, Judean nation at that time could not crucify anyone. They did not have the legal ramifications to bring that to pass. So the Romans had to do it. And a Roman cross 
it would have taken a special edict from Caesar to have put him on a stake or anything other than a Roman cross. So he was crucified on that cross, uh, ex uh, the Roman cross, and so it is. Elaine from Virginia, was Job a real historical person or was this book a parable? No, he was real. It, it, it is to show us a look, if you would, at how Satan can tempt you if you allow it. And God gives that example. Poor old Job, uh, God was so proud of him. He knew he wouldn't give in to Satan. 38 chapters of Job listening to a bunch of ratchet jaws. And I suppose one of the biggest lessons God wanted you to know from the book of Job is why would you listen to a ratchet jaw? instead of listening to God. That's why in the 38th chapter, he finally says, Job, get up from there. You listen to these people that know nothing. Where, do you, where were you when I put this whole earth and universe in the position it is? Almighty God, why don't you talk to me? That's what it's all about. And hey, I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But you know what? Most of all, God loves you for it and makes His day. When you study the letter He sent to you, to you personally, instructing you and showing you how to get by in these flesh bodies and how to attain eternal life. You make His day, He's going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. Now, most important though, listen to me. You stay in His Word every day. And His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.